Um, what I want to try and do today is argue that among other uses, um, xenobots are very useful for pushing back against uh, various forms of dichotomous thinking. Um, dichotomous thinking is a very easy thing for humans to do. It's very easy for us to decide. We know exactly where the natural uh, cut points are in the universe, divide and conquer complicated things like organisms and robots and xenobots, and then try and put things together again later. And what I want to what I want to show, what I want to talk about today is three different forms, three different forms of dichotomous thinking that have infected or influenced robotics and AI, biology and computer science. And I'm going to obviously focus on xenobots and how they push back against all three of those forms of dichotomous thinking. As I do, uh, as I go along, I'm going to touch on three different levels of collective intelligence. Um, one of the things you probably just took away from Mike's talk is this idea of multi-scale competency. Um, organisms are smart at lots of different levels and in lots of different spaces. And robots and AI, if they're lucky, they're smart at one level. Uh, forget about multiple levels. So uh, in the xenomods you're going to see today, there are forms of collective intelligence among the cells themselves. What happens if you take frog cells and liberate them from embryo? They're not in a familiar environment. Turns out they can still do some amazing things like make xenobots. I'm going to show you some zithers of xenobots. This is my shameless attempt to try and coin a, an animal group name for xenobots. I'm going to show you swarms of xenobots that do some pretty interesting things together. We could argue about whether or not that's, what they're doing is intelligent or not. And finally, um, my contribution to the Xenobots project is to bring in AI. And specifically, we're going to bring in an AI search method that is going to search over the space of all possible Xenobots or search over the space of all possible Xenobot swarms. And in essence, this AI is going to send out tendrils into morphal space in parallel. It's going to pursue different lines of thinking about how to, to mix and match uh, genetically unmodified biological tissue. And I would ar argue that that higher level is yet another form of in collective intelligence. If you think about the basically infinite number of ways that biological tissues can be combined and recombined, how does AI relatively quickly find things like xenobots that are interesting and useful uh, for humans. Okay, so just keep an eye out for those three levels of collective intelligence. As promised, um, this talk is organized around three different forms of dichotomous thinking. Brains are different from bodies, genotypes are different from phenotypes, and the tape is different from machines. I'm gonna start with the brain-body distinction, otherwise known as Cartesian dualism. Um, for better or for worse, it's guided Western thinking for several hundred years. And Cartesian dualism has made, it, made its way into robotics and AI right at the beginning when both technologies were getting going at the end of the Second World War. And today, um, if you now look at the robotics and AI community taken as a whole, it is a broken marriage. Um, we have AI researchers who, whether they're aware of it or not, um, are often looking out at the world and coming to the conclusion that brains equal intelligence. And therefore, all we need is artificial brains. All we need is neural networks to produce artificial intelligence. On the other side of the fence, you have roboticists who are really focused on the body. They, they are convinced, believe, and want to show that the body supports intelligent behavior. Uh, Mike showed the lacro lacromeria, the single-celled lacromeria a few minutes ago, which has no uh, brain but does perfectly well in its environment. Roboticists spend 99% of their time wrestling with hardware, uh, trying to get everything to work, and have about 1% of uh, brain, uh, they have 1% of their time and financial and human resources to dedicate to thinking about how to take this hardware and integrate it with the amazing software that's being developed in AI. When roboticists and AI researchers manage to actually put their minds together and try and put their various technologies together, unfortunately, this is often what happens. Not always what happens, but we often get this unfortunate result which derives from Cartesian dualism. We develop the body, robot body separately from uh, neural networks that are going to control the body. We put these two things together. This neural network has never experienced this complex environment of this robot body. And this robot body has never been moved in the way that it's moved by the neural network controller. So we have bodies and brains, both of which are sophisticated in their own right. But when we put them together, they, there's no collective intelligence. 
these two partners do not play well together. And it may seem kind of obvious that that's going to be the result. This is obviously not how nature does things. Nature did not evolve species with complex bodies and no brains, and it didn't evolve species which are essentially brains and vats, and then only later did Mother Nature try and put these two things together. Obviously, over uh, millions and, and billions of years, um, the coordination of behavior, uh, eventually taken over by nervous systems, adapted alongside to adapting bodies. Bodies and brains co-evolved, going back long before brains were even invented by Mother Nature. So for many years, um, going back to my postdoc work with uh, Hod Lipson at Cornell, um, me and others have been trying to blur this distinction between brain and body in AI and robotics. And one way to do that is to try and create machines where both the where bodies and brains are adapting. They are adapting to their environment, but they are also adapting to each other. So starting with uh, an early project we did using rigid robots, uh, in the case of a rigid robot, we introduced um, not morphological adaptation. Bodies aren't adapting in this case, but at least the body is changing. In this case, the body, change, uh, the body of the robot changes unintentionally. We sent our grad student in with a, a screwdriver and he mechanically removed the right leg, which you can see in the right-hand case. So we have the body changing and the neural network controller of this robot has to figure out how to adapt. So we have brains adapting to changing bodies, but not co-adaptation yet. When we move from uh, rigid robots to soft robots, now new options become possible. Now in soft robots, like this particular voxel bot that you see here, this was a robot platform developed uh, with uh, Rebecca Kramer Botiglio's lab, uh, at, uh, at Yale. The voxel bot that you see here, it's made up of these small hollow silicone voxels, which obviously can deform their volume uh, and shape. If you put a bunch of these together, you can make uh, soft robots with interesting body plans. And it now affords the opportunity for AI that's running on board this robot to adapt bodies to the brains and brains to the bodies. And I'll just show you an example of this. Like before, we're now going to. Uh, we're gonna come in and now cut off one or more legs of our quadrupedal soft robot that you see uh, in A. And the moment that happens, the soft robot has uh, three options available to it. It can adapt the neural control policy running on the robot. So it can adapt its brain and figure out how to move again as a brick, as it, as it is in B. So leave the body, the damaged body as is, adapt the brain. Or alternatively, as you can see in A through E here, it can adapt the body. It can try and uh, change shape to recover the ability to do whatever it was doing before it was damaged. Option three is adapt body and brain uh, together. Um, when, we, uh, when we did this, when we trained robots to try and recover from damage, this was uh, where we brought in the AI. And in this case, we used a genetic algorithm. It's a very old AI method that dates back to the 1960s. Um, this genetic algorithm is going to search over all possible brain-body adaptation strategies. It's going to search over all the ways in which this robot can recover from damage. We expected um, that in so, at least some cases, the evolutionary search process, the genetic algorithm would converge on uh, homeostasis by growing back the uh, lost limbs. You can see how a lot of this work was inspired by some of the work that Mike was just talking about. What the evolutionary algorithm often discovers are things like the following. As you can see in this little cartoon here, uh, in this particular case, we introduced a pretty severe form of damage. We cut off, we cut off half of the robot's body. Um, it's got two remaining legs. We thought either it would learn how to walk with these two legs or it would somehow deform its body to regrow uh, the missing two legs. But instead, this genetic algorithm found this solution. I'll play this for you a couple times so you can see this. Uh, the genetic algorithm discovered a way that brains and bodies can adapt to one another by retracting the two legs and then moving with peristaltic motion. What was particularly interesting about this solution is first of all, it was non-intuitive, it was a big surprise. And this is often what happens when we design robots using genetic algorithms or when we evolve robots. Evolution, like biolo artificial evolution, like biological evolution, often finds very non-intuitive solutions. 
And given the opportunity to play with morphological adaptation and neurological adaptation, it will often come up with interesting interdependencies between body and brain that we might not have thought of. The genetic algorithm knows nothing about Cartesian dualism and doesn't respect the boundary between, between brain and body. So it allows us, uh, it serves as a tool to help us dip our toes into the large sea of non-intuitive solutions where dichotomous thinking does not uh, apply. One other thing I'll mention about this particular solution is it turns out in this case, actually the brain adapts very little. The brain inside this damaged robot is almost identical to the brain that was operating the original undamaged quadrupedal robot. Evolution found a way to make big changes to the body so that the undamaged brain allows it to operate this completely different body plan. So again, as uh, Cartesian dualists, we often think that the brain, uh, the body is kind of fixed, not a great machine. It kind of is what it is and does what it does. There's much more plasticity that we can play with in nervous systems. And that's part of the reason for the neural chauvinism we find in AI. Much easier to tune neural networks and adapt artificial brains than it is artificial bodies until we allow an evolutionary algorithm to play with both. Okay, so that's rigid robots and soft robots. I'm gonna switch now to xenobots, which brings us uh, more into the realm of biology, um, where another form of dichotomous thinking exists, uh, the genotype to phenotype distinction. And as you just saw from Mike's talk, uh, Mike for many years has been doing a fantastic job of uh, providing a lot of food for thought that helps us militate against this idea that genotype in, somehow encodes one fixed phenotype. So as Mike mentioned, um, in, this ex uh, in this experiment with the xenobots, we're gonna make a pretty extreme uh, intervention in a developing frog, which is to scrape some uh, frog skin cells off of a very, frog, uh, a very early frog embryo. In essence, we're liberating these individual cells from frog uh, morphogenesis. And not only do these uh, liberated cells not die or sit there quietly and do nothing, they exhibit already some form of collective intelligence or at least coordinated uh, behavior. How much of this is physics and how much of this is biology is outside my area of expertise. There's questions about this at the end. I will, I will defer to Mike on this. But you can notice that in some way, um, the, the cells are, again, as Mike has mentioned uh, in the past, sort of rebooting multicellularity. There is some, uh, there is some aspect of self-organization going here which raises the research question of how do we push this self-organizing process towards other stable phenotypes, towards stable phenotypes other than adult frog. And as we've discovered in the Xenobots project, there are, there are many stable phenotypes that are possible. So uh, when we started our collaboration with the Levin Lab, uh, we showed some of these simulated soft robots that I just showed you a few minutes back. And Doug Blackiston, a staff scientist uh, in the Levin Lab, uh, went off uh, and tried to build a, not a Xenobot, but a Xeno sculpture um, that matched one of our soft quadrupedal robots. This is uh, Doug looking through the microscope. And as you're gonna see, there is already a re-adhered uh, clump of frog skin cells and uh, Doug is uh, performing a form of top-down design. So we're not really uh, pushing this developing process towards uh, a stable attractor. We are top-down smushing this process into a fixed form, which is a non-moving clump of frog skin cells that has the shape of a quadruped. Once we realized, uh, on the computational side, once uh, my PhD student, Sam, uh, Sam, uh, Sam Kriegman, and I realized that this was possible, our immediate next question to Doug and Mike is, can you create something, can you create not a Xeno sculpture, but a, uh, a Xeno bot? It took us a while to do this, but in, uh, back in January 2020, we published the first paper on Xenobots, where in this case, we tasked the genetic algorithm with combining and recombining two types of uh, cubes, the blue cubes and red green cubes, where the blue cubes are gonna correspond to small bits of frog skin tissue, and the red green cubes are gonna correspond to small bits of frog heart muscle tissue. 
the frog heart muscle tissue, as you'll see in the top part of this video, uh, increases and decreases uh, in volume. So this is the motor part of the Xenobot. And the light blue cubes that you see on top are the frog skin cells, which are passively receiving the impulse forces that are uh, passing up from the ventral surface of the Xenobot into the upper surface. So what you're watching here is actually the end point of the genetic algorithm. It's come up with this particular 3D shape and this particular combination of frog skin and frog heart muscle tissue. There are a lot of details about what frog heart muscle tissue will do when liberated from normal frog. And so we built that uncertainty about how to model that tissue into our simulation by having those red green voxels just sort of do their own thing. They increase and decrease in volume at random phase offsets from one another. So the genetic algorithm in essence is trying to build a machine in silico. It's trying to build a reliable machine that moves from left to right in as straight a line as possible. And it has to build this reliable machine out of unreliable parts. The frog heart muscle tissue where we're a little uh, unclear about the biological details. This is an extremely difficult engineering task. It's very difficult for a human engineer to build a reliable machine out of unreliable parts. But in this case, the AI seemed to solve this problem. It's interesting to see how it solved the problem in this particular case. You'll notice that the passive soft uh, frog skin tissue, the blue voxels on the top, they're collectively absorbing the random actions or the random force contributions of the patches of frog heart muscle tissue. They're somehow combining those random actions and channeling them into an overall non random forward propulsive force that gets the robot to move relatively straight. I would argue that that is a really interesting form of collective intelligence going on inside the body of this organism that is, has been understudied. And we could definitely use some mathematicians and some more formal analysis of this particular kind of morphological collective intelligence inside the body. Once the genetic algorithm came up with this particular design, uh, we sent it to Doug and he went to, work, uh, uh, he went to work with the microscope and working under the microscope and he actually built the physical Xenobot that you see in the bottom half. The shape is not exactly the same as you see in silico and it's not uh, moving in exactly the same way, but it does more or less what the AI predicted, the genetic algorithm predicted that it would do. As Mike mentioned, individual cells and individual patches of tissue are pretty intelligent. So whether the inherent or latent self-organization, uh, self-organizing potential of cells and tissues was actually helping here is an open question. We're, we're definitely interested in exploring that as we move forward. Okay, uh, the third and final form of dichotomous thinking that I want to try and militate against armed with the Xenobots is the tape machine distinction. Um, this influences pretty much everything in computer science, again, going back to the Second World War and the invention by Alan Turing of what became known as the Turing machine, that we can uh, describe any arbitrarily complex computer or compute any arbitrarily complex function with a machine, something actual that moves, uh, moves about in its environment or moves a tape relative to itself and operates on that tape and stores information on that tape. That distinction between instructions and the machine has influenced, uh, has influenced all computer development, all electronics development uh, ever since. One interesting place um, to explore the tape machine uh, distinction is in self-replicating machines or self-replicating computers or robots. Uh, this is a cartoon from a 1980s uh, NASA attempt to create self-replicating machines. Uh, you can see here that the robot on the left is pulling uh, physical parts off of the shelf uh, to its left and building the robot on its right. And somewhere in there, there's a piece of tape that it's also building into the robot. Uh, on the right. This is a particular form of self-replication, which has become known as kinematic self-replication. So kinematic because the robot is moving, it's reaching out into its environment, it is physically collecting the parts it needs to move and make a copy of itself. That's kinematic self-replication. It's very different from how biological organisms propagate themselves, which is through growth. All plants and, and animals, 
they grow in mass and either grow organisms inside themselves or grow seeds on their outside and then shed them. It's a very different form of self-replication that's been of interest to computer scientists and roboticists for a long time. Um, in the 1960s, uh, John von Neumann sat down and developed a formal theory of this particular form of self-replication, where he formulated an abstract machine, which has since become known as a von Neumann machine or a universal uh, universal constructor. This is a cartoon taken by uh, taken from the lecture notes of Luis Rocha, um, which I think is a great illustration of this von Neumann machine. All von Neumann machines are made up of three parts, A, B, and C, and some of them have this additional part, D. Part A, uh, which is the universal construction uh, constructor, is responsible for constructing the new machine. It uh, reads a tape, uh, shown as uh, phi here, reads that tape and instructs C, which is the operations part. This is like a little robot arm, like the little robot arm. A instructs C, according to the tape about how to build a b c and d and then finally b makes a copy of the tape and places that copied tape into the new machine and off you go so there is an obvious distinction between tape and machine here um, the von neumann machines have remained uh, theoretical for a long time uh, a few roboticists have managed to build robot versions partial robot versions of von neumann machines one of uh, my personal favorite moments in the xenobot research so far is based on an uh, offhand observation by mike and then by doug um, it turns out that you can get xenobots to perform kinematic self-replication as well here you see uh, a xenobot moving about in the dish. In this case, this particular xenobot is built just from skin cells. There's no heart muscle tissue here. Um, this xenobot is swimming, not walking. It's swimming because it has very, very small hairs called cilia distributed uh, on the outside of its body. And it waves these cilia back and forth like small flexible uh, hairs to propel itself through the fresh water sitting inside this Petri dish. Um, uh, Doug, Doug B. asked himself the question of what happens if we sprinkle disso more dissociated frog skin cells into the dish? What happens in many cases, you will have this parent xenobot move about in the dish and intention, uh, unintentionally it manages to push or smush some of these cells into a pile. Um, these uh, early, these cells taken from early embryo are uh, originally uh, adhesive, so they stick to one another. They start to ball up into larger and larger clumps, like you see here. And if these clumps become large enough and are left uh, to their own devices for about 24 hours, after about 20, 24 hours, they will grow cilia on their outer surfaces. And these small white piles, after about 24 hours, will start to move on their own. And you have now self-motile parent uh, xenobots that have produced self-motile child xenobots. And the xenobots, uh, the single xenobot that you see here has accomplished one round of kinematic self-replication. Turns out that if you make xenobots uh, by hand, um, they, make a, they achieve about one round of kinematic self-replication before the process runs out of gas for various reasons and the child xenobots are not able to make uh, grandchild xenobots. So we brought in our evolutionary algorithm, again, our genetic algorithm, and in silico, it searched over the space of all possible xenobot shapes. Here you see uh, spherical xenobots. This is running much too fast. Let me slow it down a bit. Here you see the genetic algorithm starting with spherical shapes and these nine parent xenobots do not make any piles that are big enough to become children. There's some piles, but they're not big enough. They don't grow cilia, they don't start moving. This particular xenobot swarm achieves low fitness. We're gonna select for xenobot swarms that are replicative. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. A couple of generations later in the genetic algorithm, this particular swarm has evolved that has this donut uh, shape, and nine of these donut-shaped uh, simulated xenobots collectively produce a, one big enough pile, which you see up in the left here, and this pile is big enough 
to mature into a child xenobot, but that child xenobot is not big and strong enough to make a big enough pile that matures into a grandchild xenobot. So we've evolved a shape for our xenobots that have more replicative ability. They manage one round of self-replication. Towards the end of this evolutionary run, this genetic algorithm, it came up with this, these Pac-Man shaped, these Pac-Man shaped xenobots that, oops, sorry, that manage several rounds of self-replication. And again, I'll slow this down a little bit for you if I can. Okay, so nine of these Pac-Man shaped uh, xenobots produce three piles, which are large enough to mature into children. So you're gonna see three child xenobots in a moment. And one of these child xenobots makes a big enough pile that matures into a grandchild uh, xenobot. So now we have a search process that is able to search over the space of all possible xenobot swarms, looking for shapes, that produce a particular form of collective intelligence, or at least interesting uh, coordinated behavior, which is self-replication. Uh, I see that I have run out of time, so I think I will. I think I will stop there, and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much.